We're going to open our Bibles to Acts chapter number 13, and we're going to pick everything up in verse number 4. This is the beginning of the so-called missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. Now, on this first journey, Saul is the assistant to Barnabas, who is the senior member of this team. He is the elder gentleman in this group. He's the one that has been an encouragement, the patron of Saul ever since uh, about 36, uh, when uh, Saul came to Jerusalem trying to associate with the church, and only Barnabas stood up for him. Well, here we are. It's uh, probably the latter part of the year 44. So it's 11 years that the church has been in existence, and Paul and Barnabas have been working at the church in Antioch, which is mostly Gentile, and the Holy Spirit, during a worship time of the leadership, directs that Barnabas and Saul be specifically um, ordained to go on this missionary journey. The first stop is Barnabas's home territory, the island of Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, there in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean. Acts chapter 13, verse 4. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, which is the port area for Antioch, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, Salamis is the uh, eastern major city for the island. And there they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Notice the plural there. Uh, as will become Paul's habit, uh, this missionary team starts at a synagogue of Jewish people because they are the ones that have the scripture. Uh, almost all synagogues had uh, the 22 scrolls of the Old Testament. Uh, that's the same, by the way, as our 39 books of the Old Testament. Uh, they just numbered theirs differently, combining some of the books. Uh, but uh, almost all these synagogues would have had those in a library so that people could study from them. And the Jewish people uh, met daily, and particularly for worship, weekly at the synagogues to talk about God's work. And most of these uh, these serious Jewish people were expecting the Messiah at any moment. So the most logical place to start an evangelistic effort in an area is at a synagogue, because these people are the most prepared to hear the fulfillment story about how Jesus died for our sins according to those scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, and was seen alive up until his ascension on high, uh, where he will remain until he comes as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so, uh, not just one synagogue, but multiple synagogues these eyes are going to. And it says here that they had John to assist them. That's John Mark. Now, the island of Cyprus... Uh, from one big city on the east to the other big city on the west is about 90 miles. Uh, and that wouldn't take you very long to travel that, even back in Roman times. But they're not just walking straight across the island. These guys are going from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue to synagogue. Uh, so they're in the big cities for some time uh, preaching at each of these uh, individual synagogues. They're hitting the smaller towns where there might be a synagogue. There seems to be a fairly decent Jewish presence on this island. So I believe it likely took them several months 
to work their way across the island from the east off to the west. Verse number six says, when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos. Now, Paphos is the capital city of the Roman province of Cupras. It's the capital for the island. So they have arrived to the place where the Roman prefect is going to be located, or proconsul. So when they came as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician. Now, when we talk about magician here, don't think of a sleight of hand artist. Uh, think of someone who claims to have supernatural knowledge. They know things from God. That's what a magician uh, is going to present themselves as. Now, this guy is a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Now, that's not any relationship to our Jesus, uh, because Jesus is just the name Joshua in, in Greek. And so it was a very common Jewish name of this time period. And the bar part, that just means son of. So this guy's dad was named Joshua, and he is uh, presenting himself as a prophet with inside information from God. And apparently he's been very convincing because verse 7 says he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. Uh, so he has managed to convince the highest Roman official on this island. I have connections with God. You should trust me. You should follow my advice. But then along comes a couple of other Jewish prophets. Remember, we just read earlier in Acts 13 that both Barnabas and Saul are prophets of God. And so they've been working their way across for the last couple of months, more than likely, doing miracles and providing special information. And uh, Sergius Paulus has been getting intelligence about their movements. And he summons them. He summons Barnabas and Saul, and he sought to hear the word of God. He is interested in things spiritual. Apparently, he's interested in things Jewish, uh, because he's already had a Jewish, what we know to be a false prophet, in his court for a while. Now he brings in two real prophets and wants to know their story. And you know what they told him? They told him about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, God incarnate, the fulfiller of all the prophecies, the one who died and rose again, the one who ascended on high, sent his Holy Spirit on Pentecost, who's coming again. They told him the gospel story. And this does not set well with Elimaeus, verse 8. But Elmas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, uh, Elmas has something to do with his greatness, okay? Uh, he opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So he's in the court with Sergius Paulus. He's hearing all of this gospel story, and he's poo-pooing it. He's contradicting it. He is trying to keep his, um, his hooks, as we would say, in Sergius Paulus and not lose him to these two new guys with their story about the resurrected Lord. More than likely, uh, he's getting uh, a place to stay and plenty of food. He might even be paid by... Uh, Sergius Paulus uh, during this time. So he doesn't want to let go, and so he stands as an opponent to 
the gospel. He is an antichristos. He is an antichrist. And so Saul, probably at the prompting of the Holy Spirit, decides this has got to stop because the man is making a nuisance of himself while he and Barnabas are trying to talk to Sergius Paulus. Verse 9, but Saul, who was also called Paul, and I'm going to get to the reason why I believe we're suddenly introduced to this other name for Saul, and it totally eclipses his circumcision name. But Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, so here's the prompting of the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? So Saul gets after him, basically tells him, why are you being this way? Why are you putting these roadblocks up in front of the salvation of the Lord for this man here? Why are you taking the straight path of God and twisting it up? So this guy is a false prophet who is in the way of salvation. And then Saul makes this statement. Verse 11, Now, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Now, does that sound familiar to you, that penalty? Sure it does. Saul had a three-day timeout of blindness in order to move him out of his rejection of the gospel into believing it. And so I think that uh, Saul, in some sort of ironic, humorous fashion, lets this false prophet have the same timeout period that he experienced for himself to see whether or not he will repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, unfortunately, the the traditional stories, uh, the the traditions that follow this man's career later are that he did not learn his lesson, which is most unfortunate. But here is the rest of the story. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. So, boom, just like that, he loses his eyesight, and just like Saul had done quite a few years earlier, Uh, He's trying to get somebody to lead him places. Uh, And the proconsul saw all this, experienced this firsthand, and this apparently put him over the top in believing in Jesus. Verse 12, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And even though the text does not tell us so, uh, it is certainly uh, true that he would have confessed his faith in Jesus, he would have repented of his sins, he would have been immersed into the death and the resurrection of Jesus in order to wash away those sins, he would have received the indwelling gift of God's Holy Spirit in his life, and more than likely... Paul, as an apostle, would have laid his hands on him so that he could receive some supernatural gift from the Holy Spirit. And so this becomes the first high-profile Roman official to become a Christian. Now, let me go back to the name thing. Did you see the name of this Roman official? His name is Sergius Paulus. That's the exact same name that Paul starts using at this time. 
in the Roman world, if a person became your patron and did things to help you uh, move forward in society, whether it was for your job or whether it was to introduce you to other people of prominence, or maybe even to finance your education or your travels or your work, that patron would often have you take his name, some component of it, as your own to show this ongoing relationship between patron and client. And so I believe that Sergius Paulus became a supporter of this mission trip, and particularly of Saul, because he, he saw Saul do this miraculous thing here. And because of that, Saul voluntarily took his name as his own. And from here on out, he will be known as the Apostle Paul much more often than you'll hear Saul. One more thing to take in consideration. There has been some recent academic studies regarding this Sergius Paulus fellow that have suggested that his family may have in fact been from the area of Pisidia and Pamphylia, where they're going to go next. And so it is suggested, and I think it's very persuasive, that Sergius Paulus is the one that suggested to them, from here, I want you to go up onto the coast, up onto the mainland, and go to my home area, the place where my family is at, and I will fund you going there, and I will write you letters of introduction to speed you on your way. And I think that might have also been the reason that Paul took on uh, Sergius Paulus's name at this point, uh, because uh, there's so many different places they could have gone to from Cyprus, but it seems as if they make a beeline straight to uh, uh, Perga, or excuse me, to uh, 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 to, um, well, let's try that again, uh, straight to uh, Pisidia of Antioch uh, as the next place. And so that may be the reason why they chose to do so. Okay, hopefully you've got a map, by the way, uh, in your Bible or go online and get one, check out maybe Google Earth and see where some of these places are uh, that we're going to go to next. I like to use a map online that includes all the Roman roads uh, from the first century, uh, because that helps me uh, see uh, the paths that were uh, most likely used as they made these trips. So verse number 13 says, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos, that's on the western end of the island, and they came to Perga in Pamphylia. Now, that's on the south coast of what is modern-day Turkey, which is one great big country. But back in this time, it was made up of a whole bunch of independent or semi-independent regions within the Roman Empire. Uh, so Perga is the port that they land at, uh, that they're now going to travel north inland from. And we are told that John left them there and returned to Jerusalem. So he gets on another boat and heads back home. Now, why did he do this? Uh, there's no details given here, but in the beginning of the story of the second missionary journey, we find out that Paul felt like John Mark had abandoned them. Now, I feel that more than likely he was acting as a young person, not quite yet mature enough uh, to be uh, involved in this 
um, this missionary journey. And so he just felt that he was not wanting to go any farther along. Maybe some things happened on the island of Paphos that are on the island of, of Kupros that he didn't like. Maybe he'd heard some things about where they were heading next that kind of scared him. But regardless, he leaves and goes back home. Verse number 14 says that Barnabas and Saul then went on from Perga and came to Antioch of Pisidia. And so this is a major city uh, up country from the coast. And what do they do once they arrive there? On the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and they sat down. So they go to the place where Jewish people and proselytes gather because this is the place where people are already primed for the gospel story. After the reading from the law and the prophets, uh, the way the synagogue Sabbath service worked back at this time is that they would read from the scrolls. They might have even had some sort of organized uh, pattern of reading from these scrolls. Uh, and once the scrolls were read from, then either the leader of the synagogue or some guest uh, who was schooled in the scrolls, like a rabbi, was asked to preach a sermon or make commentary, teach a lesson, uh, from starting from that passage. So after the reading from the Law and the Prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So it would appear that when uh, they arrived at the synagogue this day, somehow they were identified as itinerant rabbis, the teachers of God's word. And as was quite common back at this time, uh, the leaders of the synagogue gave them opportunity to be the guest teacher or speaker for that day. And so notice that it is Paul who takes up the invitation, because as we will be told later, he is the one that does an awful lot of the speaking on this mission trip. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, he said this, and we'll only just get partway through this because we're on, we've only got about two minutes left in our time today. Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. So Paul goes back and starts preaching from the beginning of the Israeli nation, from the beginning of the story of Judaism. He says, for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. So he's just going through Jewish history real quickly. And uh, Jewish people love it. Uh, I love to hear history. Don't you love to hear history? I hope you do. And so all of this took about 450 years. So roughly from the time they were in Egypt till the time uh, that Samuel shows up, uh, about 450 years. Uh, after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. And then they had asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. Forty years. And I believe the 40 years, there is a reference to the ministry and leadership of Samuel the prophet, plus the leadership and kingdom of Saul of Kish. Uh, because they each seem to have been in leadership positions for about 20 years each. Now, 
You can go ahead and read ahead in this over the weekend. Uh, next Monday, Lord willing, we'll get back and we will pick up this sermon of Paul the Apostle to the people of Antioch in Pisidia.